All right, young scholars. This video, uh, we're going to look at BART movement. So in your graphic organizer, you want to take a look. You want to be filling out uh, the qualities and definition of Baroque art in your center column. And then you, as I go through the different art pieces, you want to list them over here in the left-hand column. So let's get started. Baroque art is actually a very um, important piece of study and culture, European culture. Uh, in this time period. Baroque art was from roughly around 1590 to the 1700s. The qualities of Baroque art include one main light source. So if you're ever looking at a painting and you see very clearly defined light source coming from one side of the painting or another, that's a quality of Baroque art. Uh, there's also geocentric lines that are used to convey emotion. And also Baroque art was commissioned by the Catholic Church. So the, this is the Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation. And that's what made these paintings uh, very unique. So you will see uh, some sculptures and buildings that are very, very religious that a lot of people associate with the Renaissance, but it's actually kind of the very end of the Renaissance and the beginning of this new movement called Baroque. Um, another quality of Baroque art is that it uses extreme emotion to connect the viewer to religious subject matter. All right. So we'll take a look at our first piece of Baroque sculpture, and that is the Trevi Fountain. Some of you guys may know this, have seen this in some of the movies, but the Trevi Fountain in Rome is very clearly defined as Baroque architecture. New emphasis is, was placed on the bold colonnades and, and domes that were created with light and shading. And if you see this building here, it again is symmetrical. You know, three windows on each side with outcroppings and other depictions on each side. You have domed windows up at the top and triangular pediments down them. Again, the building is very symmetrical. And this is a very big tourist attraction in Rome. The next is the David. Now, you guys remember from the Renaissance, we looked at Michelangelo's Statue of David. Well, this is another artistic interpretation of the David. And this is by Bernini. And Bernini's David is also called the first Baroque statue because it focuses on dramatic movement and involves the spectator at work. So while Bernini's David was the first unveiled, many viewers ducked because it looked so realistic as if he was going to throw something. They reacted this way because... Bernini successfully explained how David's uh, expanded David's space by implying presence somewhere. So when you look at this statue, it, it's giving you a very strong emotion of conflict. All right. In contrast, other statues of David created by Donatello and Michelangelo um, really didn't use that type of space. So it's kind of David in action. Uh, David also helped establish uh, Bernini as a t Italy's foremost Baroque sculptor, and in, actually in 1647, um, he was commissioned uh, to create a huge chapel for one of the Venetian families in Rome. As Bernini was creating this chapel, uh, the focal point of the chapel becomes the next sculpture that we're going to talk about which is seen here, which is the Ecstasy of St. Teresa, which is also by Bernini. And again, this is the moment where an angel is coming down. And what's happening in this scene, very uniquely too, um, if you were to actually step into the room of the chapel, uh, Bernini has created this statue so that there are two windows on the opposite side. So the light you're seeing is actual. It's all natural light coming in from the windows. So this is the chapel's foc uh, focal point. And what happened? what's happening is St. Teresa describes how an angel uh, plunges at her uh, to symbolize divine love. And what you're seeing here, here is obviously the angel. And here he is about to kind of stab her or inject her with this love of God. And up below excuse me, up above, is this idea of almost lightning. So what the experience of sheer ecstasy that, that you're seeing on St. Teresa's face is kind of a, a feeling of just overcome with emotion and, and love for something. So again, art focusing on two 
very important um, biblical statues in this regard. And then our third piece that we're going to look at is this is the calling of St. Matthew by Caravaggio. Really neat painting. So what you're looking at here is, in fact, a painting of Jesus and his disciples. But rather than to take a kind of the Renaissance approach like da Vinci did where he painted Jesus and his disciples, Caravaggio really uniquely paints Jesus and his disciples as modern-day characters. All right. Most notably that this is a Baroque-style piece. You only have light coming in from the right side of the canvas. It's coming in, and it's coming downward, and it's shining on the apostles. Okay, take a look at this painting. Can you identify which one is Christ? Well, if you had identified the man at the far left hand, or excuse me, the far right hand side of the screen, there he is. Caravaggio uses him as Christ. So Caravaggio, we said, portrays the disciples as contemporaries who la lack perfect features and, and wear costumes and include you know, some of the, the time period dresses. Caravaggio is deliberate with naturalism and has actually shocked a lot of the artists and patrons. So this was kind of a, a new kind of thinking of the time. And looking at this painting's notice is that there's dramatic light that comes through, and this is almost – if you take a look um, at Christ's arm, it's almost indicative of the Sistine Chapel where uh, Michelangelo painted God giving life to, to Adam. Very unique kind of a throwback in that regard. So these natural figures combined with the sharp contrast make this a very profound piece of, of Baroque art that you're looking at. All right. Our next piece is a real dramatic piece. This is called the Judas Slang Hoffernese, and this is also by Caravaggio. So take a minute and take a real good look at this piece. I actually enjoy this piece because uh, Hoffernese looks very, very realistic, and just the way the light is coming down from the top left-hand side of the screen, shedding light on her Hoffernese and on Judith right here. And just take a minute and look at how realistic his face looks as his head is being severed. So the main uh, subject of this piece is Judith, the woman, who is showing great physical and emotional strength to sever the head of Holfernes. Okay, Judith plunges the sword into the general's neck, and blood is, you can see, gushing out. And again, very much like uh, Caravaggio used it, this light to really highlight not the head that's being severed, but Judith as a main character. And again, what's really neat about this piece is it also has a counterpart to it. And this painting is also showing the same subject, but it's done by a woman. And if you look at the two different pieces, the one by Caravaggio and the other lesser known piece uh, done by a woman, is that the woman, Judith, is portrayed differently. So in Caravaggio's, the woman is, is mildly attractive, dainty, petite, like a woman is. In the other painting, to show and give a little bit more credible strength to women and empowerment, uh, the woman is seen as a little bit more, a um, little bit more manly, a little bit more physically built than Caravaggio's, but nevertheless a very dramatic painting in both regards. All right, another famous piece of Baroque art. This is Las Mia Velasquez, and this is from. Spanish Baroque art. Very neat painting here. So this is the artist Vasque Velasquez's greatest masterpiece. Um, and it's actually one of the greatest masterpieces of Western art. Now, at first glance, this painting appears to be a for portrait of the five-year-old Princess Margarita and with her maids and, and uh, other people. And on the background is a painting of King Philip II and his wife. So again, it's very loyal. And again, here you have the artist painting himself into the canvas. So he's here painting the painting, which is right here. You've got a painting of Philip II. And there's Philip even in the background. So it's a very neat painting. Okay, I know everyone's going to be drawn to kind of the, the creative features over on the left-hand side. And the dog down in the, the front. 
So this painting from this painting, it's very clear that there's just more here than the royal parents, uh, and including the fact that it's a self-portrait as well. Um, the painting reflects deep concentration. At the same time, it's um, Velasquez seems to proclaim the importance of painting as his own, uh, as an important to his own status. So here he is, kind of painting himself along with the royal family. All right, finally, another painting. This is called The Elevation of the Cross by Peter Rubens. Elevation of the Cross, notice again, uh, anytime you look at a, a, one of the Rubens paintings, you'll notice kind of the color scheme is very similar. Kind of one-third of the canvas is dark, while the, the rest is kind of lighter with a, with a blend in the middle. And also, uh, Rubens' characters appear very muscular and very built. So uh, Peter Paul Rubens uh, paints The Rising of the Cross, we know that the central panel and the uh, figures are very muscular, and they're lit up by bright light on the body of Christ to influence, to emphasize that that is the most important um, piece in this painting. All right, and from there we'll hold up, and our next video will be on mysticism.